Hi, my name's Ollie, and in this Politics Explained video, I'm going to go through everything you need to know about suffrage and democracy in A-level politics. So the idea of this video, as with the others on the channel, is to give you everything you need to know. So that's not all just all the knowledge you need to know, but also specific examples and key points of analysis and evaluation that you can use in your essays. So this lesson covers um, the first two parts of the democracy and participation topic in UK politics. Um, so that's current systems of representative democracy and direct democracy, and then a wider franchise and debates over suffrage. Um, I'm going to start by going through um, key potential questions and debates that might come up um, in your exam. From there, I'm going to go into different types of democracy. So that's looking at direct democracy and representative democracy and key debates over them. From there, um, I'm going to go to assessments of the UK's democracy. So that's things such as, is the UK in a participation crisis? Um, does the UK need further reforms? Does it have a democratic deficit? Um, from there, I'm going to go into a history of suffrage in the UK. So that's going on to the second part, um, the 1.2 of dem democracy and participation. So looking at who can vote in the UK today and a history of um, increases in the vote, um, including the suffragists and suffragettes movements. And then from there, I'm going to look at potential further reforms to suffrage. So looking at votes at 16, digital democracy and e-voting, compulsory voting, and whether prisoners should get the vote with kind of key arguments for and against on either side. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, um, let's get into it. But if you if you want to look at the um, access to PDF, you should be seeing up there. Go to the Politics Explained website where you, should, you can also find um, access to tutoring, if that's something you're interested in, as well as a lot of um, free and paid resources um, that will help you in your in your politics A level, including things like essay plans and exemplar essays. But yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. So as I said, this covers um, this lesson covers systems of representative and direct democracy. So that's looking at the features of each, um, similarities and differences, and kind of key arguments for or against uh, representative versus direct um, democracy, and the case for reform. So whether there should be more direct democracy used in the UK. And it also covers 1.2, and that's a wider franchise and debates over suffrage. So that's key milestones in the widening of the franchise, um, the work of the suffragists and suffragettes, and the work of a current movement to extend the franchise, extend the franchise which I've included a couple um, for you. In terms of potential essay questions and key debates, there's quite a range that you could be asked. And the key point to keep in mind is that a lot of the knowledge, examples, and analysis um, you'll learn later in the course, um, and will also be on the Politics Explained YouTube channel, there'll be videos on them if you're interested, will be very helpful for this topic. So things such as referendums, um, things such as electoral systems, um, and then even going into UK government and issues with parliament will be really useful um, in relation to answering this question. So look at it now, but also come back and use other knowledge that you learn later in the course um, to kind of improve your essays and make essay plans. And yeah, in terms of the potential essay questions, you've got things such as is the UK democracy in a participation crisis? Um, evaluate the view that reforms to democracy in the UK haven't gone far enough. Evaluate the argument that there should be greater use of direct democracy in the UK. Evaluate the extent to which the UK remains a genuine pluralist democracy. And evaluate the extent to which reforms to the political system have improved the UK's system of representative democracy. It's quite a few questions. They're all somewhat, somewhat different. So in terms of planning for the exam, making essay plans um, on a few of those will be a really good way to revise. Um, and then trying to use those essay plans to answer potentially more specific questions. If you're interested in essay plans that have already been made, um, you'll be able to find those on the Politics Explained website um, as well. So, starting off with different types of democracy. So, what is democracy, first of all? Quite simply, it's rule by the people. And there's two key types, and that's representative democracy, which we have in the UK, and direct democracy, which we uh, use sometimes in the UK, but isn't the basis of our whole democratic system like representative democracy is. So representative democracy is a form of democracy in which the people select individuals, um, often sort into political parties to act on their behalf and exercise political choice. So that's what we have in the UK, right? We have a Conservative Party, Labour Party, lots of other parties. We vote for individuals, our MPs, who then go and represent us. It's the usual form of democracy in the modern world. And these representatives crucially aren't delegates and don't merely in take instructions from voters. They don't have to do exactly what voters say or a majority of, of what a majority of voters say. They're expected to exercise their own judgment. Um, and in that, though, they, of course, have to reflect what the people want somewhat. And they're held to account by the people through reg regular elections. 
Direct democracy, by contrast, is a democratic political system in which individuals express their opinions and vote on laws themselves, um, not through representatives acting on their behalf. So this was associated with and originated in ancient Athens, um, where adult male citizens had the right to take part in decision making at public meetings. In these public meetings, though, demagogues could win over the votes of the people. So there was still a role of kind of professional, they weren't professional, but politicians to kind of really bring people to, to either side. Um, and you can see that in examples of representative democ or direct democracy, sorry, today in referendums where you have what's quite important, are these politicians in winning over the votes of the people? So how is dem direct democracy used today though? There, there, as I said, there are ways it's used. Um, no country in the world has an entirely democratic, direct democratic system, but many countries use referendums. So that's the key way dem direct democracy is in the use in the UK today. Um, with um, infrequent referendums such as the Brexit referendum and Scottish independence referendum. There's a video on the Politics Explained YouTube channel on referendums, if that's something um, it, later in the topic, um, which you should also take a look at. Another example of direct democracy in the UK is the 2015 Recall of MPs Act, which allows a petition to be triggered if an MP is sentenced to be imprisoned or is suspended from the House of Commons for more than 21 days. So if 10% of eligible voters in a constituency, so the MP's constituency, sign the petition, a by-election is called, and therefore that's where direct democracy is used to complement representative democracy and hold representatives to account. Switzerland um, is kind of the most important example of a country that uses direct democracy a lot. So around 10 referendum style votes are held each year, giving the Swiss people a direct say over many issues. So if we think about some of the possible reforms to democracy in the UK, greater use of direct democracy, greater use of referendums in a way like that could be a potential reform. So, so there has been this use of direct democracy in the UK, but it has also raised problems. The UK is ultimately a representative democratic system based on parliamentary sovereignty. That's the idea that parliament is the key system, uh, is the key institution, sorry, um, in UK politics and makes, has the final decision on all laws effectively. Um, and the direct democracy of recent referendums, particularly Brexit, has really conflicted with that by kind of conflicting popular sovereignty, um, so of the people in referendums, with um, parliamentary sovereignty, which comes through representative democracy. So in the Brexit referendum, the public disagreed significantly with their representatives, uh, with no major party officially supporting leave, and I think around 75% of MPs supporting remain, compared to the majority in the country, um, which we saw supported leave, um, showing the disconnect between representative and direct democracy. Um, and this, combined with the fact that referendums in the UK are not legally binding, led to a second referendum campaign and Brexit taking a long time to complete, eventually needing an election in 2019 to eventually complete it. So that's where you see the use of direct democracy in the representative system, the representative democratic system in the UK, raising problems. So another way to describe democracy is a pluralist democracy. And this is a type of democracy in which government makes decisions as a result of the interplay of various ideas and contrasting arguments from competing groups and organisations. So it's effectively a very good democracy, right? Is it a high functioning, effective democracy where you want a lot of groups to be having a voice, to be having an influence on the outcome. And for many, of course, that should be encouraged as it ensures all voices in society are heard and it's less likely for minority groups to be neglected. So key points to pluralist democracy are things like pressure groups, um, the role of kind of direct democracy between elections, how, um, how responsive representatives are to the electorate, these kind of ideas, and the better they are, foster a, a genuine pluralist democracy. And some of the key questions you can get asked are how much, to what extent does the UK have a pluralist democracy at the moment? A final concept um, to look at um, is legitimacy. So you may, have, you may have come across this, but legitimacy is the legal right to exercise power. Um, for example, a government's right to rule following an election. So it's really important for governments as it validates the policies of those who are in, that are in power. Um, as legitimacy has been derived from the support of the people. So the current government um, should have legitimacy because it's been elected by the people. And therefore, it doesn't just have like the direct power to make laws, they're also seen as legitimate, right? So if, say, um, there was a coup and it was a non-democratic government, they wouldn't have the legitimacy of the people to make laws. And the final thing to look at, and this is really hitting the A-star points, um, is there's two different ways to look at democracy and you can bring this into your analysis of whether UK democracy is in crisis um, or the, the general health of UK democracy and that's the protective and developmental perspectives on democracy. So the protective perspective 
focuses on the working of democracy as a protection for individual freedom and doesn't expect large-scale um, citizen participation in politics, but rather just requires just enough to grant the system legitimacy. So democracy isn't therefore seen as a means of mass participation, but a system where a competitive group of leaders vie for electoral support in the context of a broader respect for individual freedoms and liberties. So that's kind of the general idea that the UK democracy is healthy if it has a decent amount of um, political participation, enough to grant legitimacy to the government, which can be a, an effective government um, and still represent the people. But it doesn't need mass political participation to be considered as um, healthy. And it doesn't necessarily, if there isn't this mass of political participation, so say you do have elections as they have been with turnouts of 60%, um, at least not pushing up to 80, 90%, that's not really a problem um, under this view of democracy. The other view of democracy, um, the developmental perspective, believes that for democracy to be successful, citizens need to engage on an active basis. And greater citizen engagement would achieve a more open and engaging political system, but also a more equal society that addresses gender and class inequalities in access to politics. So that's the idea that actually, no, you do need mass citizen participation. You do need all citizens to be able to access democracy and access politics and have influence in order for a democracy to be healthy. And when you have turnout figures such as 60%, um, when you have a lack of um, political interest and a lack of political participation, that is a problem for democracy. So when you're kind of weighing up whether democracy is in crisis in the UK, which is one of the key questions you could get asked, or whether there's a participation crisis, you can really um, balance these two sides, two different perspectives um, on democracy in order to evaluate that. So the next thing I'm going to look at is the similarities between direct and representative democracy. So in terms of similarities, both are types of democracy designed to implement the will of the people and based on the concept of majority rule, with the people voting playing an important role. So citizens still vote on policy in representative democracy by voting for representatives who will align with their policy positions. So they just don't they don't simply just elect a representative who then completely decides on policy. Right? They select the representative because of how likely they are to select certain policies. So it's still really about implementing the will of the people um, as direct democracy is. They can both be implemented at different levels of government, including local, regional and national. So for example, referendums, direct democracy, you see them at local level, um, you see them at a national um, level, but also a regional level, for example, the Scottish independence referendum. Uh, for more detail on that, as I said, look at the um, referendums video on the, on the YouTube channel. In both systems, the people can be swayed by powerful and clever individuals, including by politicians and those in the media. So that's not just in direct democracy where uh, political demagogues and politicians can be really um, persuasive and, and have a big sway over the people. It's also true of representative democracy. And crucially, direct democracy plays an important role in representative democracy, for example, through petitions and pressure groups which put forward the views of the public. So these, these ideas of petitions and pressure groups within representative democracy are also important to pluralist democracy, to having a pluralist democracy. Um, and it's the idea, yeah, these representative democracy requires some democratic, some direct, sorry, democratic elements in order to be really successful and represent the people well, not just at election times, but also in between elections. So to continue to be responsive. In terms of differences, in direct democracy, individuals express opinions themselves. Whereas in representative democracy, citizens elect representatives to make decisions on their behalf. So that's the key difference, right? Um, citizens are a lot more involved in decision making on a regular basis in direct democracy, requiring a lot more of citizens. So citizens really have to um, engage a lot more in politics. In representative democracy, there are political parties, whereas there aren't in direct democracy, though there are campaigns on each side of the debate. So, for example, in the Brexit referendum, you didn't have political parties, but you did have a yes um, campaign. Um, or a leave campaign and a remain campaign. So you still have that in direct democracy. In representative democracy, a government is elected which can be held accountable um, by the people. Um, that's not so much in, in direct democracy, right? There might be some elements of government um, which can be held to account, but representative democracy is really structured on being able to hold to account um, that government. You can't be really hold to account yourselves, right? Um, if you have um, that majority rule and everybody voting. There are more um, protections and representation for minorities in representative democracy, whereas direct democracy acts through the rule of the majority. So that's one of the, we'll go on to now, one of the key criticisms of direct democracy, that it acts through tyranny of the majority. And if, say, you have 51% support for something, the remaining 49% aren't really that protected and they don't get a voice. Whereas in representative democracy, because you have electing representatives, so a minority might elect a representative to represent them, even if they don't form the government, they still have play um, a significant role and can advocate on behalf of that minority group.
And then finally, representative democracy can be seen as being able to handle complex and technical political decisions, uh, political decisions, sorry, whilst direct democracy can't. Um, and that links A to the kind of the fact that in representative democracy you have professional politicians, uh, but B, just the practicalities of direct democracy, right? So say during the COVID crisis, direct democracy would not have been able to respond um, so effectively and so quickly. Obviously, a lot of countries, including the UK, didn't respond very quickly or effectively, but direct democracy would have been a lot slower and less effective. So moving on now to the advantages and disadvantages of direct and representative democracy. So in terms of advantages of direct democracy, it's that it gives equal weight to all votes, which contrasts with representative democracy, where the electoral system and constituencies mean that votes are of an equal value. So obviously, if everybody gets a vote and it's the majority that wins, and that's how direct democracy functions, and each vote is equal. It also encourages participation in politics, removes the need for trusted representatives, and minimises the possibility for corruption um, or the will of the people not being followed. And you can really see that, um, kind of uh, see concerns um, in relation to representative democracy not really representing the people that well. And there is being kind of elements of corruption and the influence of money um, in UK Parliament and in UK politics. So direct democracy wouldn't have that so much. It also develops a sense of community and encourages genuine debate with people feeling like they have a real stake in the political system, um, which can be really important in encouraging participation and having a general sense of, or kind of generally more functioning democracy if you take the developmental perspective. In terms of disadvantages, um, it can be seen as impractical in large, heavily populated modern states, um, which have complicated decision-making. Many people will not feel qualified to take part in decision-making on a regular basis, um, or they might not want to make important political decisions. They want to leave it, they may want to leave it to representatives. Um, in direct democracy, kind of people can also be open to manipulation by the cleverest and most, art most articulate speakers. And minority viewpoints, this is kind of the crucial disadvantage, may be disregarded, as it's a majority majoritarian system and the views of the majority aren't mediated through parliament. So it's often criticized for encouraging tyr tyranny of the majority. If you have 50 plus one percent of the vote for something, that gets completely um, driven through with little regard for the 49% um, of people who voted against it. In terms of representative democracy, the advantages of representative democracy are that it's the only practical system in a large country with complex problems um, needing rapid responses. Obviously, you, that can be combined with some elements of direct democracy, but direct democracy can't really be used um, as for the whole system. As I said, especially important during crises such as COVID. Um, Parties represent the public and give people a real choice of representatives um, that could be argued not that wide a choice, um, particularly in the two-party system in the UK. It reduces the chance of tyranny of the majority by giving minorities a voice in Parliament and, and that representation and influence. Elections allow representatives to be held to account effectively, ensuring responsible behaviour by representatives. And politicians are, in theory, at least, better, better informed than the average citizen and less likely to be swayed by emotional appeals. In terms of disadvantages, these will, of course, come into the advantage of direct democracy as well, as they're pretty contrasting. But um, disadvantage is that it may lead to reduced participation as the responsibility is handed to politicians. So you don't have that direct political, part political participation in the same way that you do in direct democracy. Parties and politicians don't necessarily represent the best interests of the people. Minorities are still underrepresented as they don't hold much electoral weight. So it's still the majority, there's still majoritarian rule in representative democracy, right? Even if you do have that representation of minorities within parliament. Politicians are skillful in avoiding accountability. So you can say you have this accountability at elections, um, but as elections are relatively infrequent, politicians and politicians seek to shape their own image. They're quite good at avoiding that accountability for things they've done wrong. And politicians ultimately may put their interests and their party's interests before those of the people and betray election promises, which you can see in the Liberal Democrats' um, uh, scrapping of tuition, their kind of pledge to um, scrap tuition fees. They ultimately increased them once they went into coalition with the Conservatives. And finally, in the UK's first-past-the-post electoral system, representatives are often elected with less than 50% of the vote, and it's therefore likely that more, more people disagree with them than agree with them. And that's the same. That's the the same is true of governments, um, which almost always don't have majority support from the population, even before turnout is taken into account. So representatives, and this is in the electoral systems topic, which there's a video on on the Politics Explained YouTube channel. Um, 
but both representatives and governments don't have majority support from the population in the current system of representative democracy um, in the UK. So that can be seen as a real way in which, um, a real disadvantage of representative democracy and way it doesn't function. Okay, so moving on to assessments of the UK's democracy. And that's first um, looking at whether the UK is in a participation crisis before looking generally at whether the UK has a democratic deficit. So, in terms of whether the UK has a participation crisis, first, the arguments that it does have a participation crisis are first in relation to elections, second, party membership, and third, other methods of political participation. That's a way you could organise an essay. You don't have to, that's a way you could kind of, you do for and against paragraphs for those three topics in an essay on whether the UK has a participation crisis. So in terms of elections, you can argue that they do because you have voter turnout has been relatively low, right? So it's been on the increase since 2001, um, which was the lowest it had been since the end of the First World War at 58%, but it's still hovering around 68% and a great deal less than the average between 1945 and 97, um, which was 76%. Turnout was also even lower in so-called second, second order elections and referendums such as those for devolved bodies and councils. Low turnout means that governments are elected on a reduced share of the popular vote and therefore calling into the strength, calling into question the strength um, of their mandate and calling to question their legitimacy. One explanation for this low turnout is political apathy, which you may have come across, which is a lack of awareness or interest in political issues that affect society, or just a general idea that your vote doesn't matter um, because you, citizens don't believe their um, wishes are respected or followed that effectively. Um, a second way you can talk about or argue that the UK is in a participation crisis is in relation to party membership. So only 1.6% of the electorate now belongs to a political party, compared to 3.8% in 1983. However, this differs from party to party. To party. So you've seen a real decline in party membership. The Conservative Party has just under 150,000 members by 2016, which is a significant drop from the estimated 400,000 it had in the mid-1990s. And less traditional political involvement could be associated with a negative perception of MPs due to various scandals and promises being broken. And then in relation to other method, methods of political participation, whilst these other methods, which I'm going to go through in a minute, are important, you could argue that they're less impactful and important than voting and party membership, which are key um, to how political decisions are made in the UK and the most important method um, of political participation. And it also generally, these this lack of participation, even if there is other methods of political participation, the lack of participation in elections and party membership suggests that there's less less confidence in the political system as a whole. So going on to arguments that the UK doesn't have a participation crisis, first looking at elections and, and referendums, you can see that the 2014 Scottish independence referendum and 2016 Brexit referendum had significant turnouts of 84.6% and 72.2% respectively, um, respectively, sorry, showing there's still significant engagement surrounding critical issues. And, and you could also cite the fact that there has been that increase in turnout um, since 2001, even if it's not been been massive. An alternative viewpoint to political apathy is the idea of apathy, um, suggesting that people are generally content and therefore don't need to push for change and that's why they're not participating and that could be seen as a, a more benign reason for a lack of political participation and suggest that the UK doesn't have a participation crisis. That could explain the low turnout um, in 2001 and 2005 when the UK economy was booming but not the low turnout in 2010. But obviously if you see it's up to you to kind of debate the figures, but if you see the UK is still in um, a participation crisis in terms of turnout today, you probably can't argue that so much in terms of the current cost of living crisis and general decline since the 2008 financial crisis. Moving on to party membership, there's some really key counterpoints to the idea that um, the UK has a participation crisis in terms of party membership. There was a surge in Labour Party membership in 2015 when Ed Miliband made it possible to join for just £3. Um, per month, with the party now having over 540,000 members. You saw a, a big increase as well under Corbyn. Um, and you have um, significant party membership for smaller parties as well. So following the first independence referendum, membership of the SNP surged and it ha now had over 125,000 members in April 2018 in a country with a population of just 5 million. There was an increase in membership of UKIP in the run-up to the 2015 election with nearly 50,000 members. And these examples suggest that the public will still use parties as a vehicle for political action if they're proposing some kind of radical change. Um, and suggests they also kind of potentially, especially with the SNP and UKIP, um, that people are interested in political action, 
but it's more shifted to single issue politics. So with the SNP, it's largely focused on Scottish independence, right? And with UKIP, it was very much focused on Brexit. In terms of other methods of political participation, um, you could argue that the UK is not in a participation crisis because pressure group membership has been on the increase. And you can look at the pressure groups video um, on the Politics Explained YouTube channel, um, some more detail um, on how pressure groups influence politics. And you can bring that into pluralist democracy questions. Many demonstrations have been well attended on issues such as the Iraq war, Brexit and the climate crisis. So this direct action has been recognised as a feature of modern politics, indicating that people feel conventional politics has let them down and are turning um, to new methods of expression. So you could use that to argue that there is a participation crisis or that there isn't because people are still participating, participating in politics. Social media has also allowed people, especially young people, um, to participate in politics online without engaging it in the real world, engaging in it in the real world. And e-petitions on specific political issues have been quite um, popular and successful. For example, the Revoke Article 50 petition um, in March 2019 has over 5.5 million signatures. Finally, just going to look at some proposed reforms to improve um, participation in UK elections. And that's kind of, these are kind of less significant ones than the ones I'm going to look at um, near the end of the video. Um, but you could try and increase turnout by making it easier to vote. So you could change the day of elections from Thursday to the weekend, um, allow people to vote anywhere in the constituency, um, or allow voting to take place over several days. You could also encourage a wider use of postal voting um, and introduce online voting. However, there's been, these have been criticised as they increase the chances of cyber attack, um, as well as increasing voter fraud and intimidation. Okay, so the final thing to look at before we go on to suffrage is the debate over whether the UK has a democratic deficit. And crucial for this one is other parts of the, um, of the course and of the um, specification. So you're going to need to bring in a lot of those um, into um, your essay plan for this and your essays for this, rather than just focusing on this topic. And as you'll see in the notes I've got, um, a lot of it is from other topics. So what is a democratic deficit? Uh, a democratic deficit is a perceived deficiency in the way a particular democratic body works, especially in terms of accountability and control over policy making. And some argue, some commentators argue that the UK is suffering from a democratic deficit as decisions are taken too often by those with little democratic basis and accountability. So before we look at some arguments that there is a democratic deficit in the UK, I'm going to first look at some positive democratic features in the UK political system. And that's devolved um, governments in Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, as well as elected mayors in major cities, means that decisions are closer to the people, as does the use of direct democracy, especially referendums. We have an independent judiciary, um, a free media, um, and free, fair and re relatively regular um, elections, as well as a wide range of parties and press groups in the UK. So there are arguments that the UK has positive democratic features. You could also bring those into arguments in relation to pluralist democracy. On the other hand, there's some arguments that the UK has a democratic deficit. First, the first past the post voting system, which um, is a lot less proportional than a lot of other voting systems, um, both in the UK and in, in the rest of the world. And they generally, the first past the post system generally produces unrepresentative results. Look at the electoral systems video for some more detail on that. The House of Lords is unelected and can still exercise power and halt bills proposed by the Commons, um, which has led Keir Starmer to recently propose um, to replacing it with a democratic chamber. There's a lack of protection for citizens' rights. Um, so there's a lot of arguments that the Human Rights Act is ineffective. Look at the Rights in Context video on the um, YouTube channel for more detail on that. Control of the media by wealthy, unaccountable business interests, especially Rupert Murdoch, can be seen as a democratic deficit. Again, look at the um, media. Uh, video on the Politics Explained YouTube, you know, YouTube channel for that. And then finally, many members of the House of Commons can be seen as looking out for themselves and their careers rather than caring about representation, um, as seen by many MPs having second jobs and going into lobbying after leaving politics, so the kind of revolving door um, idea. Okay, so now moving on to suffrage, and that's part 1.2 of the democracy and participation um, topic in UK politics. So starting off with who can vote in the in the UK today, before going on to kind of the history of extensions of the franchise in the UK. So who can vote in the UK elections? That's all adults over 18 who are registered and allowed to vote. British and Irish citizens have recipro reciprocal voting um, rights to vote in each other's countries. And Commonwealth citizens are allowed to vote, um, as are UK nationals who have lived abroad for less than 15 years. Who can't vote in UK elections? That's people under the age of 18. EU citizens, um, except for those from the Republic of Ireland, 
although they can vote in local elections. Members of the House of Lords, prisoners, those who are convicted of corrupt or illegal electoral practice, and people who are compulsorily detained in a psychiatric hospital. So quickly, before we go into the kind of in a bit more detail, a summary of key events in widening the franchise you can find just up there if you want to pause the video um, and look through them. But going into them in a bit more detail, so before 1832, um, the UK really wasn't that democratic at all, even after 1832, for a long while it wasn't, right? Um, but before 1832, there were two types of constituency, boroughs um, and counties, which varied considerably in size. Um, in the counties, the right to vote was only granted to those with uh, who freehold property worth at least 40 shillings, and voting rights in boroughs varied according to a range of local rules and traditions. In some boroughs, all free men were allowed to vote, whereas in others, it depended on property ownership um, or the payment of local tax. So very undemocratic and very much the rich um, who could vote. So yeah, problems with that um, pre-1832 political system um, is the distribution of seats hadn't kept up with economic growth and population movement. So you had some very small boroughs or constituencies um, still retained a historic right to vote, um, while large emerging industrial towns, especially such as Manchester, um, had very little representation of their own. Plural voting um, allowed wealthy men who owned property in more than one constituency to vote more than once. Um, women were excluded from voting. Um, and this meant that by um, the early 19th century, the electorate totaled 400,000, which was all men, um, compared to a population of around 10 million. So very much not a democratic system. The Reform Acts um, changed this. So the 1832 Great Reform Act um, abolished the separate representation of underpopulated boroughs and created seats for urban boroughs such as Manchester, extended the vote to more people in the counties, including tenant farmers and smaller property holders, created a standard qualification for the franchise in the boroughs, um, so it now applied to all male households, householders living in property who had a yearly rent of £10 or more, and the vote increased to an estimated 650,000, an estimated 5% of the adult, po adult population. Still very undemocratic, especially with the key point um, being that only men could vote. So moving on to who, who were the Chartists. Uh, the Chartists, this was a key um, um, movement um, that grew out of the failure of the 1832 Great Reform Act to extend the vote to those who didn't own property. And it's a mass movement driven by the working classes and continued for two decades. They campaigned for the franchise to be extended to all men over 21, a secret ballot, payment of MPs and annual parliamentary elections, among other things. And the next really key um, democratic movement um, to extending the vote um, was the suffragists and suffragettes um, movements in relation to extending the right to vote to women. So where could and couldn't women vote um, pre-1918 and why? Until the late 19th century, the exclusion of women from the franchise was largely unchallenged as it assumed that married women were represented by votes cast by their husbands. Women were, however, allowed to vote in local council elections, yet society and those in power were of the view that only men should have a say in issues of national and imperial, uh, and imperial importance. So a very patriarchal society, society um, and just part of a lot of ways in which women um, were discriminated against, of course, many of which continue today. So moving on to the, the suffragists. So the situation began to change in 1897 with the establishment of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies under the leadership of Millicent Fawcett. Um, member came, members became known as suffragists, or mainly middle class women. They believed in non-violent methods of persuasion, such as peaceful demonstrations, petitions and lobbying MPs. And there was evidence that opinion was changing. However, for more radical, radical campaigners, progress was too slow. And these more radical campaigners were crucially the suffragettes. Um, so they were dubbed the suffragettes by the popular press um, and were set up by Emily Pankhurst, um, Emmeline Pankhurst, sorry, um, in 1903, who was a former suffragist but thought progress was too slow. They attracted both working class and middle class support and used more militant tactics, aiming to attract publicity and put pressure on parliament for attacks on well-known institutions and the disruption of, public, um, of political meetings and other prominent male-dominated activities. So a key thing you might have heard about is a key protest um, was in 1913 when suffragette Emily Davidson threw herself under the King's Force at the Epsom Derby and ultimately died because of it, which of course gained a lot of um, publicity and attention towards the suffragette movement. So what was the public attitude towards suffragettes and how effective were their methods? The suffragettes' strength and endurance attracted hostility, but also a degree of sympathy. Suffragettes um, who were imprisoned resorted to hunger strikes, leading to authorities 
um, resorting to force feeding, which led to um, um, valuable publicity um, and depicted the Liberal government of the day um, as unreasonably harsh and kind of exposed it as being pretty unliberal. Even so, the suffragettes showed moderation when they suspended their campaign following the outbreak of World War I. So following World War I, you do have um, women, or some women being granted the vote. Um, and it's important to kind of think about how successful and effective the suffrage movement was. So the effectiveness of the two female suffrage movements remains controversial. Some historians argue that the quiet, undramatic work of the suffragists has not been recognised and the violent methods of the suffragettes alienated political supporters, whilst others argue that the suffragette movement was vital in keeping the issue of voting rights on the agenda in the decade before World War I and made politicians in 1918 conclude that if they did not grant the vote to some women, then the campaign would restart and likely be more successful in a society more favourable to equality. Another argument is that the role of women in World War I proved to the government that their fitness um, proved to the government their fitness for the vote. Um, so the vast, though the vast majority of female workers were young and unmarried and therefore didn't directly benefit from the 1918 legislation, the, um, the importance of female workers during the war um, could have convinced the, the government that um, women deserved the vote. Um, and then finally, looking at the 1918 Representation of the People Act, which is a really key act um, following World War I um, in the extension of democracy in the UK. And the Act granted all men over 21 and all women over 30 who were householders or wives of householders the vote. 75% of the adult population could now vote, and it's only now really where you could probably call um, the UK a democracy. It was passed as there was growing pressure to give all working class men the vote, considering the fact that they had no stake in the political system they were expected to lay down their lives for. Um, so they're the really key um, moments in the development of suffrage in the UK. As I said, um, scroll up and look at that summary of key events because there are um, some other key events such as when women's voting age was reduced to 21 um, and in 1969 when everybody 18 and over could vote. Um, but that, that was the key ones. A final thing I'm going to look at in this video is some potential further reforms to suffrage in the UK. So the first and probably most important one of these is votes at 16. So how has the issue of votes at 16 developed in recent times? Um, the key development um, is in Scotland, right? Um, so there was a report in 2003 um, when the Votes at 16 coalition was formed um, and found early success as they secured a study of the issue by the Electoral Commission. Though the report came down on the side of no change, so arguing there shouldn't be votes at 16, several individual Labour, Lib Dem and SNP MPs kept the issue alive in the House of Commons. Um, and Labour, the Lib Dems, the SNP and the Electoral Reform Society now all support votes to 16. In 2014, the campaign received a significant boost when 16 and 17 year olds were allowed to vote in the 2014 Scottish independence referendum and turned out significantly, um, with the Scottish Parliament then a year later allowing them to vote in Scottish Parliament elections. So, some arguments for um, our votes at 16 are that, that 16 year olds and 17 year olds have other legal rights, such as leaving school, starting work, and joining the armed forces. Um, so why shouldn't the right to vote be added to that if they're given um, responsibility and deemed mature enough to do these other things? If 16 year olds could vote, they would take part more in politics. Voting will become a habit, habit and starting it early is a good thing. Um, further, social media has led to increased political awareness among the young, and they have led recent political movements, such as the Fridays for Future climate strikes. Further, the granting of the vote to 16 and 17 year olds in Scottish elections has led to increased political engagement um, and could do so in the UK. Finally, having a vote would give 16 and, se and 17 year olds a say on issues that mean a lot to them, such as university tuition fees. So you see a more responsive democracy. In terms of arguments against votes at 16 and 17, um, 16 year olds can be argued to lack the necessary life experience and maturity to vote. Uh, they're still children and have to still be in education or training. Many know very little about politics and would misuse the right to vote. Um, better, politi better political education is needed first. On the other hand, you could say you could argue the same about a lot of adults, right? Um, so that argument potentially isn't the strongest. Whilst the young are arguably more likely to be taken in by fake news and extreme politics. Though, of course, you can debate that as well. Some of the legal rights 16 and 17 year olds are limited in practice. So, for example, few 16 year olds are in full time employment and they can't be deployed on the front line until they're 18. 
So it's not like they have every single same right as those who are 18 and therefore should be granted the right to vote as well. Relatively few countries do grant 16 and 70 year olds the right to vote. So the UK isn't abnormal um, globally. And voter turnout is very low among 16 to 18 to 24 year olds. And there's little evidence that the majority of 16 and 70, 17 year olds really want the vote. So a um, couple of final things I'm going to look at are e-voting and digital democracy, compulsory voting and whether prisoners should get the vote. So what are digital e-democracy and what do they achieve? So the terms e-democracy and digital democracy relate to the way in which uh, the development of social media and the internet have impacted the way in which democracy operates in the UK and how they could be used to improve democracy in the UK. So digital democracy also refers more specifically to the use of social media by groups that seek to spread influence. Um, and they help to inform the general public more effectively than traditional media about political issues. So you can bring this into the, um, the media topic as well. They allow organisations with modest financial and administrative resources to mount political campaigns and spread their views. So kind of pressure groups and social movements can be seen as a lot more effective um, because of digital democracy um, and e-democracy. They also allow people to participate more readily and effectively in political action um, by becoming more informed, expressing political views and taking part in polls. And have been, become key channels of communication between the government and the government. So, for example, Twitter, uh, pretty much every MP um, has a Twitter account uh, and tweets on it quite regularly to try and communicate with their constituents and gain public support. So how are e-petitions used in UK democracy and what are some prominent examples? In the UK, if an e-petition receives 10,000 signatures, it gets a response from the government. And if it receives 100,000 and is backed by an MP, it's considered for debate in Parliament. So you've seen a number of examples of this. So, for example, the Revoke Article 50 um, petition um, received over 6 million signatures. The Ban All ISIS members from returning to the UK petition um, received around 600,000 signatures and was debated in Parliament. In 2011, a petition calling for the release of all documents relating to Hillsborough um, resulted in a debate in Parliament and the release of the papers and the launch of a new inquest. So that can be seen as um, that kind of an element of direct democracy as well, and e-petitions having an influence in UK politics. And websites other than the government, such as 38 Degrees, also have e-petitions. So it's not just the government's website. And while they can't force Parliament to debate anything, they can pressure the government and opposition and provide evidence of public support for a particular issue. So, in terms of arguments for and against e-democracy and digital democracy, um, enhancing or threatening democracy, on the one hand, it can be argued that they enhance um, democracy as they increase political participation by bringing in people who don't have the inclination, um, ability or time to participate in more conventional ways, such as voting, pressure groups or party membership. They make a better informed electorate, communicate directly between the government and the government, which can be seen as really effective rather than kind of through traditional forms of media. And they enhance pluralism by preventing powerful elitist groups who have concentrated power from having exclusive access to government. Arguments that e-democracy or digital democracy threaten democracy um, are that they give the public greater access to extremist groups, such as those who are racist and those who promote violence. Disinformation is a massive problem, um, with lies having the ability to affect election results significantly. The government may be influenced by short-term populist campaigns that don't reflect wider national public opinion. So you can have something that's very popular in social media, but isn't really reflected or supported across the population. Then the final two possible reforms are compulsory voting and should pr whether prisoners should get the vote. So compulsory voting, arguments for is that voting is a social duty as well as a right, and it would encourage people to engage in politics and it would make Parliament more representative of the population. And as a consequence, politicians would have to run their campaigns with the whole electorate in mind, rather than just specific important sections of the population. It would still be legal to spoil one ballot paper and therefore not vote for any candidate, as it is in Australia, for example. In terms of the arguments against, in a preferential voting system where candidates have to be ranked, it may just lead to many putting them in order, in the order they're presented, um, so that's donkey voting. It's undemocratic. Um, or it can be argued to be undemocratic to force people and should be a matter of choice. It wouldn't stop politicians focusing their campaigns on marginal seats and neglecting safe seats. And it doesn't address, address the deeper reasons why people decide not to vote. So it can be seen as a pretty um, poor solution to a participation crisis. Or you could say it as a quite effective solution. And the final thing is whether prisoners should get the vote. So on the one hand, you can argue that voting is a fundamental right that shouldn't be removed. Um, and the European Court of Human Rights ruled that a blanket ban on British prisoners exercising the vote is contrary to the European Convention of Human Rights in 2005. 
The court didn't state that all prisoners should be given voting rights, but that the UK really needs to justify its departure from universal suffrage. Other arguments for are that losing the vote is unlikely to be a deterrent to crime. Um, crime's not going to decrease because people are, um, people lose the vote um, when they're in prison. And losing the vote also removes civic responsibility from prisoners, um, which further alienates them from society and damages rehabilitation. In terms of arguments against, prisoners are criminals and therefore forfeit the right to uh, have a say in how society is run. Prisoners shouldn't have a say in politics, especially in the criminal justice system and how that's run. And then finally, due to the nature of constituencies under first past the post, giving prisoners the votes would have a significant impact on some constituencies and have a significant impact on, on democracy in the UK um, and potentially impact on the results of elections. So that's all the content. Um, that was pretty long, but finally going back to um, the kind of potential essay questions and key debates you could get asked. So evaluate the argument that the UK is in a participation crisis. There's different ways you could um, do this, but of course you could use that that three um, topic um, option that I went with that was kind of elections and referendums, party membership, and then other methods of political participation. Evaluate the view that reforms to democracy in the UK haven't gone far enough. So you could reference past reforms to the democracy and argue that they have gone far enough um, because of, you could bring in the suffragettes um, and suffragist movements, you could bring in reforms to democracy in the UK. But then you could also bring in potential reforms and argue, no, it does need more. And you could cite votes at 16, arguments kind of for and against that. You could cite giving prisoners the votes on these potential reforms to democracy. Um, and then you could also bring in first past the post reform. Um, you could also bring in um, kind of abolishing the House of Lords. So that's kind of where bits from other parts of the course can be really useful. Evaluate the argument there should be a great use of direct democracy in the UK. So there you could do it based on the kind of for and against arguments on direct versus representative democracy and come up with kind of three for and against paragraphs and bring in a lot of the content from the referendums topic as well to answer that as that's going to be really important. Evaluate the extent to which the UK remains a genuine pluralist democracy. That's a really difficult question, um, but you could do, there's lots of different ways you could do that. You could look at kind of topics um, where you could look at elections, how, how kind of well elections involve people in political um, decision making. Um, then you could bring in stuff in relation to pressure groups and the pressure groups um, video and topic. Um, you could bring in arguments around representative and direct democracy and the use of referendums. There's lots of ways you could do that. And then finally, evaluate the extent to which um, reforms to the political system have improved the UK's system of representative democracy. So that could be looking at past reforms and kind of maybe even comparing it to um, possible future reforms as well and saying, actually, no, it should go farther and further and there should be further um, reforms the UK's um, political system and the UK's democracy. So as I said at the start of the video, um, on the Politics Explained website they'll very very soon be, um, I'll be updating the UK politics essay plans to include a lot more of these so if you want to look at some of the essay plans I've made you can purchase those otherwise you can make them yourself um, which can be a really useful way to revise as well. And yeah also go to the Politics Explained website um, if you're interested in signing up for tutoring um, or to purchase any um, any A-level politics resources, which can be really useful um, in helping you achieve the best grade you can. And yeah, that's about it. Feel free to um, drop any questions um, or comments in the in the comment section below if there's anything I can help with. And make sure to subscribe as I'm going to be bringing out um, content on everything in UK politics and UK government before the exam um, this year. Um, so that's covering everything and hopefully ideologies as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very much.